Good evening and welcome to Viewpoint. Coming up tonight, we speak to businesses closed during Gibraltar's second lockdown about potentially being able to reopen their doors to the public in the coming days. Oh, I'm so ecstatic. I cannot wait to get back into, into work again. It's really important for mental health as well because we get lots of messages like they are really sad. Gibraltar Catering Association fully supports this decision. Thrilled, excited. Um, big expectations, great anticipation. I don't think that a lot of people are going to come out. To be honest, the actions the government have taken have been phenomenal for Gibraltar. It's very good news for us. Obviously, we welcome it. It's been a, a difficult month. I think there are some businesses that are going to have to take difficult decisions. We speak to the Tourism Minister about what kind of summer he's expecting for Gibraltar. We will be in, in, in a much better place over the next uh, sort of uh, uh, six to, to eight weeks. And to the Education Minister about the decision to postpone the reopening of schools until after the midterm break. I'm very sad about this. I'm, I'm, I'm quite unhappy. I, I have really been trying to look at, at ways in which we can open the schools as soon as possible. But we start tonight by talking about Gibraltar's political future. The leader of the opposition has criticised the agreement in principle announced by the Chief Minister on New Year's Eve uh, together with the Spanish government and the UK government. He says that it has serious flaws. Keith Asopardi has called for more honesty in the debate about what this arrangement could entail. I sat down with him earlier today for an extended interview. Keith Asapardi, the Leader of the Opposition, thanks a lot for joining us on Viewpoint. Can we first ask you for your thoughts on the recent Covid deaths that Gibraltar has experienced? Well look, it's deeply sad and, and, and tragic. Um, up until the 31st of December we'd had six deaths last year and we've had since then in a month another 64 deaths yesterday, you know. Um, up to yesterday, so making a total of, of, of 70, of which, you know, of the last 64 deaths, we've had 39 in ERS. I think that's a, a deeply sad and, and tragic situation. We've got to remember every single person of those is a, is a father, a brother, a sister, a mother, and they've got families, they've got friends, and, and so it's really having a toll on this community. And for a while last year, we thought that we had saved ourselves in, miraculously from, from the worst effects of the pandemic, and yet the pandemic is hitting us in the same way as uh, it's hitting any other country in the world. Of course, we're only 30-ish uh, thousand people, um, so we're more comparable to, in terms of population size, a small city than a country. But nevertheless, when we look at um, data published worldwide, if we look at the number of uh, vaccines administered so far, first doses per million, Gibraltar's doing very well. Uh, but if we look at the number of cases per million, and if we look at the number of deaths per million, Gibraltar's right at the top of those tables also. What do you make of that? Well, look, it's, it's important to factor into the statistics, the fact that we are a small territory, so any kind of slightly new number tends to squonk the statistics. That, that's, let's, be, let's be clear, that's, that's the case. It's also, it's, it's also been the case that the government for some time has been promoting the fact that in terms of testing we are very high in the league table and so on. So you can't have it both ways. If, if, if that's the case then you've also got to look at the other statistics and, and in terms of percentages, raw percentages of the population that have suffered deaths, then we're also, the reality is, I think, the analysis is that we're being dealt with by the pandemic in the same way as any other country in the world. We haven't got out of it. We haven't miraculously saved, saved ourselves. And, and, and that's the important way, I think, to look at the statistics, not on precise numbers because of the size of the territory. So, um, any comment on um, where we are and what you think the government should be doing? Uh, we're on the verge of unlocking, for example, but now we've heard that schools won't reopen until uh, another two weeks later. Uh, any comment on that? I mean, can I first say on the issue of deaths that I think one of the issues that we need to think about and, and ask and get answers on is the situation at ERS. We 
completely understand the difficulties that staff ha have there. We completely understand the pressures and that they're working really hard. But I asked questions in the, in the House uh, for clarification. We didn't really get full answers. And the Chief Minister in a subsequent press conference said that there will be a public inquiry uh, and, and that's the time for it. Well, the public inquiry is in a couple of years' time, maybe. I think families need reassurance and they've got normal questions if 39 out of 64 deaths happen to be in, in, in the last month at ERS, I think it's legitimate for families to want to know um, what protections and restrictions were put in place. Um, it, it may well be that, that, that uh, everything possible has been done um, and I'm not cert certainly suggesting anything else but I think it's important that, uh, that families also get that reassurance and not have to wait for, for a couple of years. I, I'd say that first. Secondly, um, in, in terms of the sort of wider lockdown... I th uh, Sorry, uh, if I may, Dr. Sabadi, I suppose the important uh, context there is that care homes have been the most vulnerable uh, places uh, yes. in Spain and the UK also, haven't they? Well, and, and it's important to recognise that the environment of a care home is precisely that. It has frail, elderly, vulnerable people. So we perfectly understand that as soon as the virus gets into ERS, it's going to rage across that environment. It's fertile ground for a pandemic. It's fertile ground for a strain of the virus that is more virulent. I completely understand that. That's why I'm not saying uh, more than uh, families want to have reassurances. And, and I don't think those reassurances need to wait for a couple of years. In relation to the lockdown, I think as a starting point, we take, we take the view that it's important to, to, to restore commercial and social freedoms at the first available opportunity. I think that's common ground with, uh, with the government who have repeatedly said, the Chief Minister has repeatedly said that he wants to restore liberties, civil liberties to people. I think that's important. I think the lockdown was entirely appropriate. We supported it. Um, those measures have worked. They are working and you see the trend that the, the, we're not getting the daily new positives that we were, but we're still getting positives, new positives in around the, a figure of 30 uh, on a daily basis. We still have around 400 positive, positive cases. We think that there should be some easing of restrictions on, on the 1st of February. I think that that is justified. Um, but I think we need to tread carefully because we're dealing with a more virulent strain. It's obvious that it's mortal because it has taken away 64 of our citizens in the last month, so we've got to tread carefully. So, so we understand that, that the government is doing that. And in relation to schools, I think the decision could have gone either way. Personally, I think, uh, as the minister said, that, uh, that uh, he was confident that teachers who had the vaccine and the pupils would be in a safe environment. I think it could, the government could easily have decided to open the schools uh, and then have a natural break in 14 days' time because you've got midterm, so that acts as a circuit breaker. But uh, we don't, uh, you know, we don't object to the decision that uh, that there should be an extension to the to the end of midterm. If we move on now to um, the agreement in principle announced on New Year's Eve, you have been critical of some of the aspects. Um, you think that uh, of what we've seen so far, which is a text leaked by the um, El País newspaper, um, that the uh, provisions in that for control at the Gibraltar airport are um, a concession to Spain. I mean, quite clearly they are. And I think one of the things that I, I've always been saying consistently since that agreement was published, and we were able to see the final text because we hadn't seen a, a, a draft of the text to, uh, before after the 14th of December, is that it's important to have an honest debate. It's important to have an honest debate. And, and there are a number of myths being put out by, by the government, which is, which is not leading to an honest debate. You know, the myth that somehow we have succeeded so far. Well, the government failed in 2018 to get a good agreement for Gibraltar, it failed to obtain things that were enduring for Gibraltar, and it's failed again um, to obtain a treaty by the, uh, by the 31st of December. The, the UK have a 1,400-page treaty. We've got an eight-page non-binding framework. The reality is they failed then, and they failed again, and, and so we're, we are just beyond the starting line. There's the, the myth of the rainbow of, of opportunities, as the Chief Minister described it on uh, the 31st of December. We are not in a position 
based on that vague framework to decide either way whether there is or is not going to be a rainbow of opportunities. There might be an adverse economic effect, depending on what the detail of the uh, agreement is. There is a myth that he's got a mandate to, to negotiate a Schengen Customs Union deal. Um, and as a result of the 2019 election. Look, the election manifesto of the GSLP mentions Brexit 114 times. It doesn't mention Schengen once, nor does it, by the way, mention the word customs union, um, those words. So, so you know, the, let's have an honest debate uh, as to where we're going. Let's have an honest debate of where, what we've achieved so far. Let's have an honest debate of what the agreement says. The agreement is a fairly vague framework which raises question marks, and to the extent that it has detail, it raises concerns. If I can take some of the points you've made there in turn, uh, firstly that it failed, the government failed in 2018. Everyone, uh, I think, agreed that the worst possible scenario would have been for Gibraltar to have not had a transition period yes. when the UK had one, and we were part of the transi or we had a transition period. So in that uh, in that sense, the government, I'm sure has argued uh, previously that they did not fail, they, they secured Gibraltar's place in that transition period and avoided the worst possible scenario. But I'm not judging it against the no deal scenario. I'm saying, did we get a good deal or a bad deal? I'm not judging it against the no deal scenario, nor am I judging the New Year's agreement, as the Chief Minister describes the eight-page non-binding framework, against the standard of a no deal. Of course, of course it's better than no deal. But that's where we were heading. No, no, but of course it's better than no deal. My point is, we should have achieved a good deal because Northern Ireland in 2018 achieved enduring freedom of movement. The frontier workers in Gibraltar achieved enduring freedom of movement after the 1st of January 2021 as a result of the 2018 agreement. Why could we have not? At that time when the British government was weak, negotiated enduring uh, rights for the people of Gibraltar as well. Where, where we, were, we failed then and we failed now because the opportunity now was to achieve a binding legal agreement by the 31st of December. The British government, for its own objectives, negotiated in its interest and obtained that. We, um, we haven't done that. We've achieved only a non-binding agreement. Is it better than having reached the 1st of January without a deal? Well, of course it's better to have bought ourselves six more months to keep talking to try to achieve a binding framework. But the reality of the situation is that the government failed to achieve a binding agreement. And we are where we are because they did not achieve what the UK achieved. And that's the reality and the honesty required in this debate. Is it better than no deal? Absolutely it's better because we keep talking. But that's all we're doing. Is it also better than a bad deal? Well, of course, keeping talking is better than a, than a bad deal, uh, un undoubtedly, because you keep alive the prospect of what I have been talking about for some time, which is to get a safe and beneficial agreement for Gibraltar. Safe, so because there's no concessions on sovereignty, jurisdiction and control, and beneficial because it's good socially, it's beneficial politically and it's beneficial in economic terms. But you think that in respect of um, the, the obvious comparators, uh, the UK, Northern Ireland, you think that Gibraltar has fared the worst in terms of political security? Well, we have clearly fared the worst because we still have uncertainty. The, the Northern Ireland and the UK have political certainty and economic certainty. And when, when people are making investment decisions, they want to know what's going to happen in, not in two years' time, but in five or ten years' time. So when they're going to invest in Northern Ireland, at least they have the certainty that that's the deal. And you can plan accordingly. When you're planning in relation to Gibraltar, you still have the question mark as to, whether, as to what the economic model of Gibraltar will be, what our relationship would be with the European Union in a political, economic or social sense, uh, and, and what investors could do. So that's the macro picture, if you like. Let's uh, zoom in on some of the details, uh, the, the parts of the agreement in principle which have the most detail uh, and seem the most certain uh, relate to mobility uh, and this uh, uh, Schengen arrangement. What do you make of it and what are your problems with it? Well, I mean, let's be very clear that I have been saying for a long time that the priorities for Gibraltar were freedom of movement and market access. So to the extent that 
you're trying to build an arrangement which will guarantee to the people of Gibraltar freedom of movement or what is now called mobility in terms of a Schengen kind of arrangement association it's not something that I reject I think that it's important for the, to, to secure freedom of movement I don't think Schengen might have been the only way we could have had some kind of hybrid common travel area you, there are all sorts of ways of achieving the freedom of movement concept but as a concept it's a good concept the issue is in the detail of course uh, because in the detail it's very clear that uh, you, you know, Spain will acquire responsibility in respect of um, those checks in Gibraltar. It will be done by Frontex for an implementation period. We will need to look at the detail in the treaty. But Spain is going to give instructions to those, uh, those Frontex officers. And so uh, it's obvious that there are concessions on jurisdiction and control because those officers are exerting powers within Gibraltar and 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 the point about that you know if we were in a situation where our neighboring state did not claim our sovereignty well then perhaps a lot of people would not have a problem with that because it would be the price of a deal but the you cannot disconnect the fact that we've had a 300 year claim that there is no trust and confidence built up with Spain, that Spain have a consistent track record of trying to undermine us, of trying to uh, break down our economic model, our political model, and in trying to achieve a Spanish flag over our rock, and therefore you cannot disconnect it. So when you look at the possibility of Spanish officers having exerting jurisdiction and control, even if they are not here, it's an obvious concession uh, on, on, on that. So do you think it's a concession uh, if, if what is envisaged for the first four years, you think that even before, uh, because Spain would like its own um, law enforcement uh, agency to take over uh, from Frontex, but you think even within the first four years of implementation when there are Frontex officers, that is already a concession to Spain. Uh, do you think that it is an unacceptable one? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a concession in the sense that Spain is going to be exerting jurisdiction and giving instructions to the Frontex officers. So let's be clear that that is what is going to happen on the ground. And, uh, and that's the reality of the framework. And uh, we'll see what, what the treaty says. But the framework makes clear that the, Spain will give instructions to the, to the Frontex officers. Is it, is it a concession that I think is unacceptable? Well, I think it depends on the wording of the treaty because that's not the binding issue. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll see when that emerges. I think it's possible to enter into a, an arrangement that works for that four-year period. Well, Frontex are there. I think what people are much more emotionally uh, affronted by is the idea that there would be Spanish officers in Gibraltar directly exerting jurisdiction and control, and that, I think, is unacceptable. Uh, and you have, that's common ground with the government. The GSLP Liberals have said that they would not accept that either. Yes, well, uh, ostensibly that appears to be common ground and the Chief Minister has made pronouncements similar to me in respect of, of Spanish officers. I think the difference between the Chief Minister and me is that he falls short of accepting that there are concessions on jurisdiction and control and I'm calling for an honest debate. Let there be a debate where people understand that you're negotiating on a position where you're trying to achieve mobility, freedom of movement in Europe, you might be trying to achieve economic benefits or not, and there is a price that people want on the other side. I mean, that's the honesty of the debate that we need to have. Let's not trick the people of Gibraltar into what this agreement says. And, and what I'm asking for is that the debate should be honest. I mean, the Chief Minister, I suppose, in Parliament has gone so far as to say that uh, in any negotiation, there's give and take. He just hasn't identified what he has given. No, be well, of, because he doesn't want to, because it's on clear on the face of the agreement. You know, what is Spain getting? Spain is getting an, a degree of economic controls like they got with the MOUs on tobacco and alcohol and so on. They want economic controls. They got the tax treaty at the time of the 2018 withdrawal agreement, which uh, González Laya has asserted uh, are inroads on fiscal sovereignty. Spain will want an agenda, will want a price. Those, those concessions are clear. The problem about the debate is that, is that not that the Chief Minister doesn't want to identify it, it's just that he doesn't want to admit the fact that they, that, that they 
in exchange for certain things, they've made concessions, which are concessions, oh, but he jurisdiction has said that and control, quite clearly, that affect the way that we live our lives. It may be that at the end of the package, uh, people may want to accept it, but let's have an honest debate about that. Okay. Well, my, my point was just as a matter of fact, he has acknowledged that in, in any negotiation there is give and take. But uh, yeah, yeah, Yes, he does. But I, I, but I think he, what he doesn't then do is take the extra step to have that honest debate because he gives in to his natural tendency to want to spin the argument and say that everything that the government are doing is fantastic. And that's not real. It's just not real and it's not what's happening now. The former Chief Minister, Sir Peter Caruana, um, suggested that the government today needs space to be able to negotiate uh, the best possible agreement for Gibraltar and at the stage that it becomes a treaty uh, draft, should it get that far, that when the details are then um, described fully, that would be the moment to, to have a full and honest debate, not now. What would you say to that? I don't think he said that. I think he said that it's important that the government have space. I don't think he said the latter, that there shouldn't be a debate. There needs to be a debate on the issues of principle. And, and let me make it clear, we have given the government sufficient and significant space to negotiate. They've been negotiating the deal. We've known that they're negotiating the deal. We've not pressed because we want to give them that political space. They've kept us informed. We've communicated our concerns privately to them. We thought that there were concessions that were, they were making. And I wrote to the Chief Minister on the 17th of November, despite that letter, he's entered into a principles framework that contains those things that we warned about. We're going to give them space to negotiate as we go forward because we want a safe and beneficial deal. But it's important that there should also be a debate. We're not going to get, surely, we're not going to be asking for there to be a political vacuum until a draft treaty emerges. The good thing that the Chief Minister said recently in Parliament is, when I probed him, is that he will take the draft treaty to Parliament so that we can have a debate. And I think that's an important matter which he, which he accepted in Parliament, that needs to happen. We cannot have a situation where the treaty is signed and then it's debated in Gibraltar or in the Gibraltar Parliament. It needs to be in draft, needs to be presented, and we then need to have a full and proper debate in Gibraltar. As, just for the record, you're right that he didn't, that Sir Peter Carvalho did not say now is not the time for debating, but he did call for the sufficient space. I, I was paraphrasing his, his comments. Um, what about this uh, idea that Gibraltar might be able to come to a bespoke arrangement on customs? What's your view of that? So, so I, when I look at the Schengen aspect and the customs union and I make the comparison, with Schengen at least it's obvious what you're getting. Um, you know, you get the, the sort of Frontex officer, the Spanish instructions, etc, etc. But with the customs union you've got no real idea of what you're getting. It's, a, it's really a clause that is simply put, a, a, a clause that enables you to enter into discussions about the possibility of some kind of customs union. But then there are indications in the rest of the document that I think gives concerns because, you know, to enter into a customs union, you will need to radically change the Gibraltar economic model that we have had forevermore. Uh, that requires not just consultation with the with the business community. I don't think, for example, having just set up uh, the TLAC, an advisory body, to advise the Chief Minister is enough. I think there needs to be a wide consultation. They need to scope what they intend, issue some kind of consultation paper. They need to take advice from experts, economic experts, in relation to our economic model and how it would work if we were in some kind of bespoke customs union. That requires time. I'm concerned that we will not have enough time. I think those studies need to be carried out. And the point about all that is that they are very big issues and they bring silent economic Trojan horses. Because in the same way as you know what you're getting with the Schengen deal, you don't know what you're getting in relation to the economics because Spain will want economic controls. There's clear from the agreement that they want some handle on, on further MOUs, perhaps again on, on control of pricing. They will want further, uh, a further handle on, on things that are of an economic nature. There is a clause on what is called reinforced alignment, um, which is just that word, reinforced alignment, will require us to have some kind of economic regime 
aligned but then reinforced to the EU. There is a, there is a level playing field clause. These things are just framework clauses. They're not specified, so there's a lot of detail that needs to be understood as to the impact on the economy. When you are planning um, the economic model going forward, because there's such an element of vagueness, it's impossible to say today whether there is, in the Chief Minister's words of the 31st of December, a rainbow of opportunities for an area of shared prosperity or actually an adverse economic effect going forward. And I think it's the duty of the opposition to bring those points to the fore and ensure that we have a proper economic debate on consequences too. So uh, there's not enough detail basically for you to uh, give us uh, a, an indication as to which direction you think Gibraltar should pursue? No, because look, the customs union debate's a big, big debate to be had. And it's a big debate to be had in terms with, uh, with the business sector. Uh, and it needs to be done on the, against the backdrop of advice as to the kind of sketched economic model that we want. Does the government, for example, have a sketch of where it wants to go and if it does well let it consult the, the business community but more widely and let it let it issue a public consultation paper or is it that actually they're just feeling out the situation don't really know where where the six months of negotiation negotiation is going to lead us i mean all that needs to be flushed out i think Okay, so um, the eu and the uk uh, have six months to uh, try to come to an agreement, obviously uh, Gibraltar and Spain being the, the affected or most affected parties uh, by a potential agreement. How would you like the next six months to unfold from Gibraltar's perspective? Well, look, from Gibraltar's perspective, the bottom line is that at the end of that six-month period, what we want is to be able to look at the text of a treaty and make the judgment that it is safe and beneficial, because ultimately, we don't want there to be no deal. We want, we want it to remain in the EU and therefore we want a positive, lasting relationship with the EU for political reasons, we want it for social reasons, for quality of life reasons and for economic reasons as long as it is beneficial to Gibraltar. And that is what we want, bottom line, that is, that is how we would like to see the end of the process. In terms of the process itself, Look, I, we, we're not involved in the negotiation. I don't dictate our involvement or not, or not involvement. What I want to see is a degree of transparency about the issues, honesty of the debate, and that we have a full and considered debate and that we don't jump into things that then come back to bite us because we didn't have enough time or thought on it. And in terms of um, optimism or otherwise, how hopeful are you that, uh, that there is space for Gibraltar to achieve something that is beneficial and, uh, and long-lasting? I'm by nature a cautiously pos positive person um, because I'm not an emotional person. I don't, uh, my level of positivity or negativity never pitches upwards or downwards in a sort of uh, deep, significant way. I think that there are signs that there is the right climate, at least, the right political climate, which is the first step to be able to have productive negotiations. I think it's important against that backdrop that there should be an honest debate, that people should be told, that people should be told exactly what is happening, the price that needs to be paid, and then hopefully uh, there will emerge a treaty built around foundations that we will be able to accept as the people of Gibraltar. Leader of the opposition, Keith Azapardi, thanks a lot for joining us on Viewpoint.